Civil War medicine to many, in comparison to modern times, was somewhat archaic. Fortunately, by the 1860s, we had some very useful inventions that had come along in the 1840s, namely chloroform, which is a general anesthetic, was developed in the late 1840s and was used widely, it was the preferred anesthetic of the period, along with ether. Chloroform was preferred most of the time, largely because it is much simpler and quicker to administer than ether. We had had narcotics in the form of opiates for many, many decades, even centuries. By the 19th century, we had learned to make them into tablet forms to be much easier to administer and swallow. And if you noticed, we had a brand new invention that we thoroughly enjoyed using called adhesive plasters. Thanks to the inventiveness of some scientists in the 1840s who dissolved rubber with solvents of toluene and benzene, they were able to make a sticky substance that adhered to strips of cloth, which could then adhere to human skin. We had these readily available and used them widely, most often on amputations in holding the pad of flesh together over the stump of bone. It was quicker, simpler, easier than wire sutures and promoted healing better than the wire. Of course, we knew about infections, but we did not know what they were, how they were, where they came from. But by the end of the war, we had learned that cleanliness promoted healing. It was a long struggle. A lot of it brought about through the United States Sanitary Commission, which was a civilian organization that I'm sure Mrs. Ross will be happy to enlighten you on. They were chartered by Congress and authorized by the War Department to inspect camps and hospitals and began gradually throughout the war to convince the surgeons, particularly the old regular army surgeons like myself that had been around for several decades, that hand washing, clean instruments, clean linen, clean bandages, clean wounds made them heal better. Doc, is he gonna make it? Is my he's, brother gonna make it? He's gonna make it, gonna make it. He got the bullet out, he's gonna be all right. We'll keep him here for, we'll keep him here for a week or so. He'll be all right. There's a good sized bullet in there. Will he ever walk again? Oh yeah, he'll walk. That's good. He'll walk, he'll, he'll, he'll walk. walk. That's good, Doc. Give a week or two. <laughs> During the war that iodine became initiated and used as a wound cleanser, that solutions of chlorine and or bromine were used to clean hospitals, to clean linens, to clean beds, and that changing the dressings on a regular basis promoted healing. We had to learn that pus was not part of the healing process. It was a common belief up to this time that if a wound was not pustulating, it was not healing. And so we had to learn that no, pus was not good, pus was bad, and to eliminate the pus. He's resting comfortably. Chew this up. Chew it up, chew uh -huh. it up and swallow it. You'll be all right. Mm. All right, easy, easy. Okay. Brother, whoever you are, brother, it's here. All right. Easy. All right. All right. Swing it out. Swing it this way. Come on. You're all right. You're all right. It's all, it's all put back together. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. Uh -huh.
Easy, easy. Lean on me. Lean on me. Let's go in and lay you down. You can come with him. Another one fixed up, huh, Doc? You'll make it. You'll make it. The instruments that I have here, which is a capital surgical set, includes not only the scalpel you saw me use and so other similar ones, several different types and styles. If I can grab another one, there we go. We had the capital saw. Excuse me a second here. There. We had the capital saw, which was used for amputations of large bones in the arms and legs. A metacarpal saw, used for the smaller bones of uh, hands and feet. A large liston amputation knife for circular amputations of arms and lower legs. That's the large liston knife, by the way. This is the small liston knife. We had smaller instruments called catlings that were much narrower, very sharp pointed, double edged for flap amputations performed primarily on the upper leg. And the flap amputation would provide two overlapping flaps of tissue and flesh to protect the stump of the bone when it was placed in a prosthesis. Various probes, large, small and large probes for probing into body cavities looking for bullets, following the tracks of wounds, although the surgeon's primary probe was right here on the end of his hand. Many surgeons actually left their, na their nails a little long so they could scratch around and find the bullets. Bullet forceps made for extracting the bullets from deeper wounds, different types of scissors, instrument called a tenaculum that had served many purposes. One of its main purposes was for locating and pulling up bleeding blood vessels so they could be tied off with the silk or linen ligature. The ligature was left with ends out of the wound. So one of the, one of the daily jobs of the surgeon in the hospital was to daily go by each. Each soldier that had a, had a they tied off bleeder, gently tug on the ends of the ligatures, and the day that they came off, it was assumed, hopefully correctly, that the, that the bleeder had healed. In the bag, I have a couple of three other things. I have cloth retractors. This one is particularly made for a single bone, upper arm or upper leg. These were wrapped around in such a way the assistant surgeon or assisting steward could retract the flesh above the damage in the wound so that the surgeon could cut the bone above the damaged part of the bone. We got roller bandages. Yes, these were available. There weren't many of them. Um, the first stethoscopes were single ear wooden cones. It was originally developed by a French physician in the very early 19th century. One day he rolled up a piece of paper and realized that amplified the heartbeat. And so he developed wooden cones. After Mr. Goodyear developed the vulcanization of rubber, then it was able to be formed in many different shapes. And by the 1850s, someone had invented the binaural or two-eared stethoscope and simple stethoscopes were available. Very, very few of them made it into the war. I would have been very, very fortunate surgeon to have particularly a two-year stethoscope, but they, they were there. I also had a pocket kit. The surgeon could put in his, in his coat pocket or in a haversack, carry out on the field. We did not have field medics. Field emergency care was performed by junior surgeons, and in here you would have a small variety of scalpels, some small probes, forceps, scissors, small packet of needles, 
different shapes and sizes. Silver linen suture, and some wire suture, and usually a small piece of wax. These wax are paraffin to wax the thread, so it made it easier to use. I have one very interesting neat thing in this particular kit. Thanks to one of our club members who works for the museum. I have an original scalpel. Ebony Wood handled original mid 19th century scalpel. Yes. <laughs> it was worth the whole little kit that he bought. Let's <laughs> go get that one. Thing.